All right now, today it's Sunday, and just like I've mentioned before, it's time for a new summer blockbuster. This will basically be the third new film that I've covered in this season of films I'm willing to talk about again. And for this occasion, here in the third week of July, I bring to you Twisters. Yeah, this is basically a good 28 long years after the original product that practically changed the course of natural disaster related films. Universal's Twister was an insanely well-made peace of mind when it came to natural disaster films. And there had been many over the years that had come and gone, like Earthquake and even a couple Avalanche related films. But then of course came the tornado in 1996's Twister. But you know what? Maybe that's something I'll cover down the line. For now though, we have a new version of it, but it's even more bigger and has even higher stakes than the predecessor of its time. Nearly 30 years later, with Twisters, you could probably never go wrong with something that's even bigger than the original. Being that they had such a big budget worth over $200 million to put together, it's no wonder why Twisters has such impeccable effects and even a large cast with the likes of Daisy Edgar Jones, Anthony Ramos, and Glenn Powell. So, let's get started with the story. It begins at some unknown point in history. In fact, the years aren't necessarily called out at some point, but we could gladly assume that the beginning of the film takes place somewhere five years ago, likely 2019. So, yeah, that's just pretty much what I'm going off here because in any other case, what we have here is a prologue comprised of the likes of four people plus another person. You basically have Kate, whom is in fact the leading role in the film, whom has three accomplices with her as she is essentially chasing storms and hoping to catch a tornado as part of some school project of hers in high school. So talk about something really big for just a simple school project. But in any case though, they set off with yellow barrels full of a certain powder of some sort. Their plan is to apparently leave the barrels behind in the hopes that they'll get sucked up into the tornado that's coming towards them while they're driving off into the distance. And while the plan does work, it unfortunately comes with some surprising changes that they were not expecting. Apparently, the particles were actually being tracked by Javi, basically the fifth member of the group who decided to stay behind and monitor from his laptop in the distance. He finds that the particles apparently have shot over 70,000 feet into the air, which really does beg the question. Is this tornado even more powerful than you realize? After all, the Fuji scale, or F scale for short, monitors the size, weight, expenditure, power, and of course the entirety of the storm's output of a tornado formation. Typically, when a supercell is formed with the combination of cold and hot air fronts, that's what ultimately creates those famous whirlwinds that have been around for centuries and have been documented in many different ways. This one apparently came as a shocker when they found that it was a powerful F5. And being that it was the state of Oklahoma, basically the nation's capital for tornado related activity, it came as quite a surprise that it went from a simple F1 to an F5 in a mere instant, likely because of the particles contained within the barrels. They all but made the tornado even more powerful. So what did they have to do? Well, they had to abandon their car and try to find shelter under an overpass. But unfortunately, not everybody makes it out alive. Kate is basically left alone with a massive scar on her left thigh. A scar that bears an extreme reminder of her devastating past. Five years come and go until one day, she does have a full-time job as a meteorologist in Brooklyn, New York. 
yeah, she decided to get out of Tornado Country. The famous Tornado Alley, which mainly sits in the direct center of the majority of mainland U.S., basically from North Dakota to Texas, that's essentially where tornado activity happens to be the highest within the states. Being that cold and air fronts are very common in these areas, even out here in the Midwest, there's certainly no shortage of the likes of F0 through F2s that have come around here. Like I could talk about the summer of 2008, how it was one of the biggest possible eras in tornado related activity in this area, or pretty much in general. I remember a lot of people made videos on the internet and it was quite a time. Anyways though, Twisters gives us a new opportunity, not just with the shocking prologue, but also with the meetup of some old friends. Basically, Avi comes in to the conference room at Kate's work site, basically surprising her, her with his presence. He talks about his work with the government and the military branches that he had served with throughout the five year expenditure that came around after they last saw each other. But of course, he comes with a bit of a conclusion that he'll actually need Kate's assistance with something back in Oklahoma. The very same state that she had gotten scarred with the loss of three friends plus her own thigh getting heavily sliced up. Yeah, that sure was quite a bad day for her, but now she's being asked to go back to the very same spot where she had once been hurt. So it's like revisiting old memories that you never want to see again. She of course refuses at first, even going so far to leave him be in the local cafe. But Avi doesn't give up. In fact, he sends her a text message about some breaking news, destruction left behind by various F-scale tornadoes, F-3s and 4s mainly, but there of course was no shortage of the likes of F-5 appearances. And well, Kate eventually does oblige, and she goes to work with him and his own team. A team of agents with high praise technology and panels that are capable of tracking the tornado, as well as monitoring its power and expenditure and destructive capabilities, so that way they can eventually alert the likes of local towns and cities that may be within the path of the tornadoes themselves. So this way, they could probably evac or get to safety quickly. Of course, with Kate's assistance, they were able to make some eventful progress. It's certainly worth noting that the team itself is comprised of four members, Wizard, Lion, Tin Man, and Scarecrow. Yeah. A good 85 years ago was when the Wizard of Oz became one of the very first pieces of influential and popular pop culture related media to showcase a tornado in action. Of course, Universal named their first film Twister after the very thing that they referred to in Wizard of Oz, a twister. So you could definitely see a big connection within both of these films. 85 years apart, the old trends still keep on coming. But even with the best of new technology, the one thing that certainly held Kate back was her own emotional repression. Being that she lost a lot of herself, a lot of colleagues, and her left thigh bears the massive scar that extends from end to end from that piece of debris that sliced her up, it came as no surprise really to most of us when she apparently hesitated for quite a bit. Even going so far as to letting a rival company led by a man known by the name of Tyler Owen. Glenn Powell, of course, nails this performance. Basically a man who is willing to ride tornadoes as a part of a social media campaign, earning a million subscribers on the likes of YouTube. So it definitely is quite a shocker to see a competition between the likes of a highly capable and technology praised team versus a wild crazy series of stuntsmen riding tornadoes 
with a heavily modified ram. Even utilizing the likes of drills to bore deep holes into the ground to prevent them from being sucked up, as well as an extremely heavy underframe meant to hold them down to the ground, plus a number of other things. In fact, I even remember when Ram themselves was actually leading a certain raffle to give a free Ram pickup as part of this movie's advertising. So, unlike with the first film, we have a film that was capable of granting enough money to have a Ram and giving it away for free to anybody whom participated in a raffle. So, that's certainly something well worth noting in this instance. Of course, when all the plans failed and Tyler once again gets his share of glory within the tornado itself that comes down, well, it's up to them to try again some other time. After some time passes though, when they find their way to a motel that they stay around for the night, the likes of both Tyler and Kate pretty much begin to come together when they get to know each other a little better. Because it was one thing for them to have a bit of an awkward moment knowing Tyler's somewhat smug attitude. I mean, Powell himself certainly knows how to pull off the emotional spectrum at a level where it feels glorious in mind. The very next day though is when things do start to play differently because what we have here is actually a series of double tornado formations. One is at the east and one's at the west. And before they set off, Kate does of course issue her piece of advice to Tyler, noting that she would rather head east rather than west. Of course, this doesn't play out exactly as she would hope for because the, hopefully the plan was at the time to trick Tyler into thinking that the east one was gonna be better, when in reality, it apparently wasn't. And how she knew about one being weaker than the other remained a mystery, even to us. We have no idea how she could pull it off. But it was the one at the west, however, where the true opportunity lied within. Because when they set off, Tin Man, Scarecrow, Wizard, do successfully manage to land their panels However, in the case of Kate and Javi, their panel ends up getting sucked and they now have lost their way of tracking the tornado's progress, especially noting the path that it was heading to, towards a town that likely could be hit hard. Of course, when Tyler realizes that he was in fact scammed, he still goes after the other one and, well, it does seem that while the other team had the upper hand, it was the loss of that one panel that cost them another day's worth of progress. But of course, that was pretty much the least of their worries. Because once they do find out eventually that a town had been hit, they go off to save as many people as possible, along with local emergency services. Even Tyler and his crew come along to assist the folks from within, even going so far as to offer them merchandise and whatnot. But little did Kate know that in spite of them taking advantage of the situation, they were in fact, deep down, being as helpful as the rest of them. In fact, some may argue that the money that they were making from all these videos they've uploaded to the web of their tornado adventures, it's possible they could have been used to help fund the towns that may have been damaged or destroyed. And so once Kate eventually does realize this whole thing, her and Javi do have a heated argument and she eventually goes back to the motel only to be greeted by Tyler with a pizza in his hands. Eventually an invitation comes to her where Tyler and Kate head off to the local rodeo and the fun basically does go along just as well as their current relationship, which does seem to go a bit deeper until the leaves start falling. Apparently these green leaves were in fact coming from a distance, a distance likely generated by powerful winds. Sirens go off, the announcer of the rodeo declares the rodeo to be closed due to the high winds and impending storms from within. That's when everybody proceeds to evac 
and Tyler and Kate try to find solace at a local motel that is not at all like the one that Kate and Avi were staying at, for the time being at least. This motel was different, especially when it came to a certain argument that was going down with a certain tenant, as well as somebody at the motel who apparently doesn't even work there, that a refund should be put in place. We certainly know that in the heat of disaster, a refund to a certain crappy motel room is the least of your worries. Because once they do eventually get out, unfortunately, not all members of that family at that motel survive. Two of them get in their pickup, end up getting sucked, while the rest go and follow Kate and Tyler into the local swimming pool nearby, where it's apparently empty. It provides convenience for them to hold tight until the tornado passed. And much like we've seen before, destruction comes in all ways. A massive trailer gets dumped into the pool and nearly crushes Tyler as he proceeds to cling onto the pipes nearby. And when all is said and done, the damage is insane. Even when in comparison to the last town that a tornado destroyed within the film's plot, this one was unbelievable in contrast. Avi does come back to offer an apology, and well, Kate eventually just storms off. Well, by all logic, it's clear that Avi doesn't understand Tyler and his many intentions on helping people just as much as the rest of them. So, it's gone from a misunderstood competition between two different teams of storm chasers to something even greater than we'd ever thought. Everyone here would have thought that between Tyler and Avi, it was a competition between two different teams on who could get better at tracking a tornado and helping to prevent disaster from unfolding and saving lives in the process. Yet here it does play differently, which is certainly something that feels a bit more fresher than one would have imagined. Still, Kate proceeds to go back to her old childhood home, even going back to that same barn where she had assembled her own scale model, complete with a fan above to simulate a tornado devastating an entire town. And what comes up next is, well, more interactions between Tyler and Kate. It almost does seem to come along as some sort of weird feeling that he could be coming down on her, but in the end, it basically just comes down to a simple subliminal agreement between the two that no matter what side she may be on, she still feels like they have good intentions. Avi has his intentions of using technology as a means to capture a tornado and helping to prevent disaster and lives from being lost by using the technology to create the best possible simulation. Whereas with Tyler, he goes directly into the storms, the likes of which that nobody would dare do in order to capture the action himself. Of course, the money that he makes off these videos, I really am under the impression that he could be using them as a form of funding for the towns that have been destroyed and the lives that may have been shattered. So, I don't know where else to look at from here, but in any case though, the following day, when Avi comes back once again, this time Kate does accept his every apologetic note that he left and in addition to that she eventually goes back with him to once again try their hand at taking down a tornado this time however they proceed to use the likes of silver iodide the same substance that's been used for many years to induce rainfall from the clouds above and this substance supposedly could help push the cold fronts in on the tornadoes being that heat is ultimately what helps create the supercell and in turn generate the whirlwinds when the air collides. And when the cold front gets larger, it eventually chokes out the tornado from within. They then proceed to use their typical substance of sodium. That's pretty much what the substance in the yellow barrels was known as. Not only did they proceed to make a huge batch of this powder, 
but they also intend to use the mixture of both sodium and silver iodide to choke out an entire tornado and see if it works. And well, after some time passes and some attempts to get from within, it eventually does work. The rockets full of silver iodide do induce enough rainfall to equalize the amount of temperature and pressure from within the tornado. And with the addition of the sodium being sucked up from within the barrels, it actually works. In one case, at least. But then of course, believe it or not, another, another one comes in. And this one gets even crazier because it eventually hits an oil refinery. It explodes and the heat gets so intense, it turns the simple F2 all the way up to an F5. Talk about the stakes being raised. Enough heat was certainly all it needed to create a tornado much more powerful than even the one that Kate had five years ago. So the challenge was trying to find a way to choke out an F5. Being that Kay couldn't do it with the conventional method she tried earlier in her life, she had no way of tackling this new one. And you know what? It gets even worse. Apparently, this F5 was actually going straight into the town of El Reno. And as we know, El Reno was the biggest, most powerful tornado in history back when it unleashed in 2013. And so, this was one way to retell the story of El Reno, even by universal standards. They weren't quite well for capitalized on bringing about real life stories into their pictures, but I'd say in this instance, an F5 hitting El Reno, it's definitely a bit of a retelling of the real life story from within a summer blockbuster in its own right. And so, it's a no brainer here. We're literally watching El Reno happen within Universal. So, I'd say they had to get around to that point at some time. Anyways though, this F5 was definitely not playing around because when it came to El Reno, it brought down a water tower and it brought down even a trolley, which actually pins Tyler's legs. And while Kate tries her best to pry the debris off of him, Avi comes in with a special prying technique of using leverage from a nearby object, much like how he did before when a trailer flipped over earlier. Well, his usage of leverage does work in this instance just as well, but it's crazy. He lifted a trolley, whereas he lifted a trailer five years earlier. And in any case, they proceed to head to the nearby movie theater to hopefully allow the storm to pass. They eventually realize, though, this place was actually not structurally sound for tornado related activity. So now, Kay comes up with the idea of borrowing Tyler's ram along with all the sodium powder that was in the trailer behind it. She intends to stop the tornado herself, which she does, even going so far as to use the drills to bore holes into the ground to secure the pickup. And when all the barrels come flying open, all the sodium's released, it does, believe it or not, work. And just in time too, because some of our other characters were slowly beginning to vanish, being sucked away by the power of the F5 itself. And when the F5 finally dies down, it's all cleared up and everybody is relieved that she was actually able to stand up to her own past and fight her repression that she had had since that fateful day where she lost life as well as a part of herself. Again, that scar is there. So, when all comes down, the week of work between her and Avi is over, they proceed to exchange goodbyes at the airport where she proceeds to go back to Brooklyn. And then when Tyler goes up to speak with her one last time, weather reports show another storm warning, once again, implying that more tornadoes are around 
and they have to be on their guard. So, I guess you could say, it's one of those classic cliffhanger notes where we likely could get a sequel out of this. And I haven't really known much about the box office results, being that it had just come out a few days ago, and I had watched it on its premiere day. So it's hard to tell what the weekend box office amount is like, but maybe I guarantee that with a good cast, impressive effect, and exciting action, and tons of suspense in mind, plus a decent soundtrack made by the likes of Benjamin Wallfish, who was also responsible for the likes of the 2019 Hellboy remake, as well as the Shazam films. So it's incredible that he was able to bring his composition talent straight to Universal with the Twisters remake. So my overall conclusion to this is that it's an insanely well-made film. In contrast to the original, which still felt like an impressive piece, being that its effects were very far ahead of its time, and the action, while not as enormous as this, still does retain that classic vibe to it, despite it not being as old as other well-known Universal blockbusters like Jaws or Back to the Future, but it still does hold off on its own. In fact, the Universal theme park ride, Twister would ride it out, was probably one of the most memorable experiences I might have had every time I'd gone to visit Universal. But, wouldn't you know, I actually have plans to go there in a couple of weeks, once again. Seven and a half years after I last went there. So, I guess we'll just see how that trip turns out. Maybe I'll have an entire blog dedicated to it. Who really knows? In any case though, the overall rating for Twisters, great cast, nicely made soundtrack, and probably some of the best action in a real life action film. It goes down to a good old rating of 8.9 out of 10.1. So you have a lot to work with in this one film. And I do hope that when it comes out on digital, I can get it at a good discount in UHD glory. So I'll be back with some more material relating to bonus content for films I'm willing to talk about again. But as I've said, I'll likely talk a bit about the original Twister later on in this series. So, I'll be back tomorrow on Monday with another piece. And as always, make sure to like, subscribe, comment, follow me wherever you can find me, and stay on the Hollywood side for more. I want you, but I don't have you yet. I ain't got no tricks uh, to be playing on you.